Either or is quite possibly my favorite book, maybe besides the Bible, and I often credit it as the reason why I have faith in God today. I personally would highly recommend that everyone reads it, because it's really interesting and a fun read, even though it might be the most confusing book that I have ever read. It takes you on an interesting journey where Kierkegaard fights with what seems to be himself about what the ideal lifestyle should be. He destroys all the pillars that we may rely on for meaning and happiness, and he often does it in comical ways. Then he gives a final solution to the mess that he creates, but I'm going to save that for the end. We have a lot to cover, so I want to get right into it. I will attempt to summarize it as best as I can, however, in order to understand the book, I need to lay out some basic ideas in other works of Kierkegaard. We must first look at how Kierkegaard grew up and what his background is. He grew up in Denmark in the 1800s where everyone would have claimed to be a Christian, and Kierkegaard hated it. He knew most of them were merely nominal and had no true faith. They grew up in the church and said all the right things and probably hadn't spent any real time thinking about faith or God. They had no doubt in their beliefs because there was really no reason to doubt because everyone around them believed exactly what they did. Kierkegaard would venture to say that of all the people who claimed to be religious, very few of them were actually Christians. He would often mockingly call them the Christian mob, or mass men as he would put it. This feeling should be relatable to many people who grew up in the church. Kierkegaard saw faith as an extremely individualistic experience. Being a true Christian meant being an individual who did not care about what man thought. Rather, he cares what God thinks of him. With that understood, we have to look at some of the basic ideas that he holds before we go into either or. The first idea that we have to talk about is truth. Truth to Kierkegaard can be separated into two general groups. The first is objective and empirical truths, and the second is subjective truths. Now, I don't want you to get confused here. Kierkegaard is not speaking of subjective truth in the way that most people would understand it today. It doesn't mean my truth and your truth. The subjective truth that he is speaking of is more of an experiential truth. To give you an example, let me put it like this. Let's say you run an experiment that involves throwing a brick at someone, and you record the results. You throw the brick, and the person recoils in pain. Again, you reconstruct the experiment, and the same result occurs. Now, after your experiments, you have concluded that being hit by a brick hurts. Duh. You know this as objectively true. However, you have no means of understanding this truth on a personal level until you yourself are hit by a brick. In other words, you don't need to get hit by a brick to know that it hurts, but you need to get hit by a brick to know how it hurts. This is what he means by subjective truth. It is the feeling that cannot be explained in the same way an objective truth could. How are you to quantify such feelings as your soul, or anxiety, or love? These things are immaterial and difficult, possibly even impossible to prove even though we all experience these things daily. If you had anxiety, you may be able to explain the feeling to another person, but it isn't until they experience anxiety themselves that they will truly understand the subjective truth you are experiencing. Try to imagine explaining what empathy feels like to a psychopath, or what listening to music feels like to a deaf person. You'd be better off trying to explain what the color blue feels like. We all know that each one of us will die, but none of us know what it feels like to die. This is what Kierkegaard means by subjective truth. Truths that must come through experience rather than head knowledge. Now the religious experience can be placed in this subjective truth realm. Many atheists will say, there isn't enough objective proof for me to believe in God. While well, Kierkegaard would say, of course there isn't. There may be some proofs like prophecy, historical evidence, and the like that people can choose to examine for themselves, but in terms of objective, quantifiable, and experimental truth, you will have trouble finding anything truly undeniable. This isn't to say that the Christian faith is without reason, but Kierkegaard would say that the atheist is looking for proof in the wrong places. The truths they should be seeking are the subjective truths that we spoke of earlier. Kierkegaard would say it like this, Faith comes in where science leaves off. Or, to have faith is to lose your mind and to win God. 
Kierkegaard speaks in this way because we often place too much trust in our own ability to perceive reality. We are three-dimensional creatures trying to understand a being that is infinitely greater than us. We must suspend our complete trust in the finite world and balance it with the infinite. Kierkegaard speaks of people who go too far into the infinite and those who are too set in the finite, and he says both are wrong. There must be a balance between objective reality and subjective truth. This is very similar to what Socrates taught. He has much to say on this topic, but we really don't have time. I want to get into either or. But before that, I need to describe what he means by faith. There is an element of faith in every belief we hold. But how would Kierkegaard define faith? To him, faith is the means of balancing doubt and belief. In Kierkegaard's eyes, if you were to say, I know without a shadow of a doubt God exists, Kierkegaard would say, you have no faith. Faith requires doubt, and doubt requires faith to balance it out. Think for a moment about all the things you place your faith in that are not God. Pascal might chime in here and say, we put our faith into many things, and most things are far more uncertain than religion. We have faith that our car will turn on and we will get to where we want to go. We have faith that we can go to sleep and we will wake up in the morning. We have faith that when we sit in a chair, it will not break. Pascal and Kierkegaard would say, we have faith in God in the same way we have faith in our everyday experiences, because we can and do experience God. Now some Christians may say that doubt is bad, and doubt means that you aren't a true believer. That when you question your faith in God, this must mean that you are rebellious. Kierkegaard would mock this idea. He would say, doubt is actually the proof that you have faith. Without doubt, there is no faith. Otherwise, your faith is blind. The one who places his faith in God is the one who knows of the doubt and still, in spite of the doubt, believes with all his heart. Such a person is what is known as the Knight of Faith, another concept that is far too deep for this video. The Knight of Faith is someone who sees the doubt and feels it in his innermost being and yet believes anyway. He sees the doubt on one side and faith on the other, and he throws his entire being into the direction of faith. This is far greater of an act of faith than saying, I have no doubt that there is a God. Where is the faith in saying that? To stand and smugly say, I am right about God and I have no doubt, is wrong in Kierkegaard's eyes. We ought to be humble and say, I have faith in God and his work in my life and the world around me. This is why so many Christians that are full of their proofs that God exists so often have little faith. They have decided objectively that God exists rather than fallen into the subjective truth that God exists through experience. This is also why arguments about God's existence usually lead to nothing more than race tempers and a lack of understanding. The atheist is looking for objective truths that definitively prove God exists, whereas the Knight of Faith is trying to give subjective truths as evidence. To explain what faith is to someone who is looking for objective evidence is like trying to put a square into a round hole. I know this is confusing, but I hope you're keeping up. This is all just to lay the groundwork for moving into either or, because he'll go into a lot of these concepts more in depth in the book. Now in either or, Kierkegaard speaks of two characters who live nearly opposite lifestyles. The one seeks what Kierkegaard calls the aesthetic life, which is essentially hedonism. He seeks out all his pleasures, and when he gets the thing he was seeking, he grows discontent and bored and seeks something else. This character is young and without responsibility, he chases after whatever desire is in front of him, and he is never content. Even in his frustration, he continues to try and convince the other character to join his lifestyle. The hedonist character in the book eventually will erupt with a very comedic line that goes like this. Marry and you will regret it. Don't marry and you'll also regret it. Marry or don't marry and you will regret it either way. Laugh at the world's foolishness and you will regret it. Weep over it and you will regret that too. Laugh at the world's foolishness or weep over it. You will regret both. Hang yourself and you will regret it. Do not hang yourself and you will regret that too. Hang yourself or don't hang yourself, you will regret it either way. Whether you hang yourself or you do not hang yourself, you will regret both. This gentleman is the essence of all philosophy. 
Now the hedonist lifestyle is plagued with being discontent as we can see. All of the pleasures he gets joy out of eventually become boring. Now the second character in Either Or lives the opposite life as the aesthetic character. The second character's life could be summed up as someone living by the ethical mode of existence. This person has escaped the lifestyle of hedonism and decides to focus on helping others and obeying the rules and trying to make the world a better place. The ethical character tells the aesthetic one to get married and to focus on children, to find fulfillment there rather than in pleasure, but to no avail. In the two characters' letters to one another, they are trying to convince the other to live in the opposing lifestyle. During their discourses, they break down every pillar we would like to rest on for comfort. The ethical character breaks down why the hedonistic lifestyle is shallow and meaningless, and the hedonist breaks down why the ethical lifestyle is boring and unfulfilling. The great irony of the entire book is that it's really difficult to tell which of these characters reflects Kierkegaard's actual mental state. Maybe neither one does, or maybe it's a mixture of both. Maybe one reflects Kierkegaard's early life and the second is his future self. This is the difficulty of reading his works. However, Kierkegaard eventually reveals what he wishes for all people. After hundreds of pages of back and forth trying to convince you to live either the aesthetic life or the ethical life and destroying all hope of either in the process, Kierkegaard poses another solution. The religious mode of life. The third and hidden solution. But what is the religious mode of life? It's when we obey God and put our faith in Him above all else and against all reason. Now, in other works, Kierkegaard goes far more into detail on the subject of faith. In Fear and Trembling, Soren uses the father of faith as the prime example of someone living in the religious mode of existence, this being Abraham, the first knight of faith, as he would put it. He goes into great detail about the story of Abraham and the struggles he must have gone through in order to have faith in God. You may have heard a common phrase known as the leap of faith thrown around. Kierkegaard is the one who coined it. This phrase comes from a person who can finally get to the edge of reality as they know it and leap into the abyss. But this leap is not into an empty abyss. The person has faith that this leap will be into the hands of God. This is what Kierkegaard means by faith. It is when we are able to reach the end of the objective truths we can see all around us and leap into the hands of our Heavenly Father. We cannot use logic or reasoning to get to this point because jumping goes against all our logic and reasoning. All of our logic and reasoning is telling us not to jump. We have no tests or evidence to know if we will survive the leap or if God will catch us, but we have to have faith that he will. This is what faith looks like to Kierkegaard. To have faith is to lose your mind and to win God. If I could compare either or to any book of the Bible, it would easily be Ecclesiastes. After all the toil and struggle of the book of Ecclesiastes, the conclusion is, have faith in God. Now in the same way, all the struggling and back and forth in either or leads straight to God. Ecclesiastes depicts Solomon, the wealthiest and wisest man who realizes how meaningless everything is without God. The same thing happens in either or between the two characters. The ethical and aesthetic both realize how empty their lives are, and this is what brings us to God. The end of either or has a sermon entitled, The Edifying in the Thought that Against God We Are Always in the Wrong. It's a beautiful ending to such a confusing book. The sermon focuses on relationships and the anxiety that comes from them. It invites you to imagine if your partner wrongs you, what lengths would you go to to justify that in your mind for why they would have wronged you? You would rather you were in the wrong against them to justify why they wronged you. Because if they just wronged you for no reason, that means that you will lose your trust in them. You will no longer be able to love them in the same way that you used to because they let you down. Now Kierkegaard shows us that we cannot trust people because they will wrong us sometimes for no reason. But against God, we will always be in the wrong against him. And therefore, we do not need to have anxiety when we put our trust in him. He will never let us down because against him, we will always be in the wrong because he is so much greater than us. 
If God does something that hurts us, we do not need to worry by thinking, maybe God was in the wrong, because against God, we are always in the wrong. Therefore, we can be fully confident in putting our faith and trust in God because we will always be in the wrong against him. He will never let us down. Thanks for watching, guys. I know his ideas can be hard to understand sometimes, so I hope I explained them well enough. Soon I will be making a video that goes into depth on fear and trembling and about Abraham's walk of faith and the night of faith and what that even means, but that's for another time. I hope you enjoyed this brief explanation of either or. Check out my channel for more content like this. Thanks for watching.